Hello everybody and welcome to our Rochdale and Littleborough Circuit online Bible study for the month of June. We have been asked to look at the book of Isaiah and this is um, a Methodist Bible month study. It says it's a toolkit for us and our church. Now there's a Chinese proverb that says may you live in interesting times. Well, it can be said and is said that the book of Isaiah is set in interesting times. What you make of that word interesting is dubious, maybe, because interesting can mean different things to different people. But in this context, it says the book of Isaiah is set in interesting times because it was a time of great political shift, of international instability, and of social tensions and in the end wait for it catastrophic upheaval i hope and i pray that that is not the case for us in today's world but who knows we don't know do we when we think of uh, pred predictions of the end of the world and all the stuff that is out there however this Bible study gives us a bit of an opportunity to look at some of the themes of Isaiah and myself and my circuit colleagues will be looking at this with you, presenting some things, presenting some topics for questions. This introduction will feature at the beginning of every episode, um, but obviously the study changes each week. And the questions will be on screen for you to see and it may be good that you would pause at that point. There will be opportunities to pause the online message and just so that you can have time to, to read and to digest some of what is being asked and some of what is being said. So we hope you enjoy it and we look forward to your feedback at a later date. Our final readings for this our Bible month of Isaiah come from the latter chapters, starting with chapter 40, verses 1 to 2. And it's entitled Comfort for God's People. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Our next reading is from the chapter 65, starting at verse 17, and it's entitled New Heavens and a New Earth. Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight, and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard no more in it. And the last reading is from chapter 66, verse 22 as the new heavens and the new earth that i make will endure before me declares the lord so will your name and descendants endure amen so i'm here to ask the questions that ruth is going to reflect on and the first question is this do you think that you have a responsibility to look after our planet and each other? And how might you do this? When I was preparing for this, the weather was just horrendous. It was one of those days when the rain was so hard you thought it was going to come through the roof. And then suddenly the sun would burst through and it was really, really hot. But significantly... I saw a lot of rainbows and that took me back to the story of Noah and God's promise that he showed to Noah through a rainbow. 
and here's the story of Noah. God was sad, very sad. Everywhere he looked, he saw people making bad choices, hating each other, hurting each other, making a mess of his world. I need to start afresh. I need to make my world clean. And he talked to Noah. Noah wasn't like the rest. He was good and God knew it. So God told him to build a boat, a big boat, a very, very big boat, big enough to hold Noah, his wife, his three sons, their wives and a pair of every animal in the world and enough to feed them for a long time. Noah's family was surprised when he told them what he was going to do. Neighbours thought he'd gone a bit mad building a boat so far from the sea and it wasn't easy chasing, catching and cleaning up after all the animals. But Noah was a good man and he did what God told him to do. At last they were all safely tucked into the boat, they shut the door and then it started to rain. It rained for 40 days and for 40 nights. It rained harder than Noah had ever seen in his life before. So hard the streams and rivers and even the sea burst their banks. Soon every sandy beach, rocky path, patch of muddy water had disappeared beneath the water. And the boat began to float. It floated above the houses, above the trees, above the hills and eventually above the mountains. It floated for days and weeks and months and then it stopped, stuck, on the top of a mountain. Noah opened a window to look out. The water was going down, but the world was far from dry. So he sent out a dove, and when the dove did not come back, Noah knew it had found a dry place to build a nest. Come out, God called finally. Come out of the boat. The world is dry. The world is clean, and now you and your family and all the animals must have children and fill it full of life again. God was really happy, and he painted a rainbow in the sky to celebrate the fresh, clean world and to promise that he would never send a flood like that again. It's good to remind ourselves of the story and the original reason for a rainbow being painted in the sky. Our planet is frankly in a mess. We've seen lots of programmes on the television about the state of our oceans, of the state of our skies, the state of all sorts of things to do with our natural world. And that made me think about what could you do to make a difference to the world, to reduce your carbon footprint? Could you, instead of using your car, walk or go on the public transport? Do you reduce, reuse, recycle as much as you possibly can? Do we compost or just throw everything in the bin? Could we plant a tree or maybe two trees? Even if you live in a flat, do you have a balcony that you could put a tree on to help with the ozone layers in the skies? Have we switched to LED lighting? Do we eat sustainably? Do we look at where we're buying our food from? Do we mind that these strawberries are being flown in from Peru in the middle of November? Or do we wait with excitement for the strawberries of the summer? How can we give up on plastics? It's really hard, isn't it? Could we use filtered water instead of bottled water? All things to ponder, all things to think about and how we can be good husbandries to our earth and to our planet. How and what could you do differently to nurture our planet? Question two. What do you think is wrong with the world? that you would like to see change in this new world. For example, peace between nations and people, poverty, climate injustice, equality, inclusion, even more simple things like patience and time to be and not to be rushing about. 
What do you think is wrong with the world? Big question. Thinking about the second question that Helen's asked us made me think about two things. Social justice and who is our neighbour. The other day, instead of just listening to the news or reading the news, I decided to write a list. A list of all of the bad headlines that I was hearing or reading, either in the newspaper or online, and then to write a list of all of the really positive headlines that I was hearing and I was reading. And unsurprisingly, the list of really... The second thing that the second question made me think about was, who is our neighbour? It got me thinking because I bought something from a very traditional English company and it was a piece of clothing. And when I got it home and I had a good look at it, it said made in the People's Republic of China. And I was quite surprised, I don't know why, because a lot of our things are made in China. But it made me realise that we are quite a small world. But then I thought, I've been to China and I've actually seen the working conditions of a lot of the people and they're awful. The people sleeping where they work, people eating where they work, there's no safety. It's really, really hard going, very inhumane conditions and incredibly poor pay. And I'm contributing to this because I've bought this item unknowingly, but from the People's Republic of China. And that made me think again about how we are involved in creating inequalities without even knowing it. So I then thought if I have a good think of all the people who are involved in providing me with something, a bunch of grapes, my mobile phone, where do all of the different parts of my mobile phone come from? Where were they made? Where were they put together? How many people were actually involved in me purchasing this mobile phone? And when you start to add up, that's a lot of people in the chain, isn't it? Just the people who make the raw materials, then the people who gather the raw materials and take them to a factory where they're all manufactured into different things and then they're all put together and then they're all marketed so you've got a marketing department and you've got a delivery department it's an enormous amount of people and they're all God's people and they're all part of our world so I'm going to encourage you to have a look at something in your house something quite ordinary a bunch of grapes and think how have they got here and how many people have been involved in me and the enjoyment of eating these grapes and thank God for them. Following on from that picture of the rainbow which seems to have featured a lot actually recently um, that symbol of hope the question that I want to pose to you is this what does hope look like for Christians and how does it make a difference in our daily lives? Over to Ruth. So we think about the third question that Helen has raised for us. What does hope look like? I think for me hope is making time that you can reflect. Have you got a seat on the park or somewhere where you can go and just be just able to reflect and maybe join in a conversation to watch the creation and people and just look at who are on the margins who has nobody to talk to often when i'm walking with i will meet people who stop and have conversations with me and i think to myself that might be it that might be the only conversation that they have. It's a sobering thought, isn't it? And how could you help somebody who might be on the margins of society, might be really struggling? How would you interfaith with them? How would you communicate with them? How could you get to know them? 
I've got a story about hope. A teenage boy from a village moved to the city for a job to support his family. He applied for a job in a big firm. After some days, he went and attended the interview and successfully completed all of the tests. The hiring manager said, you're hired, give me all your details for further processing. Also, make sure that your bike is in good condition as you have a lot of travelling to do to meet customers. The boy replied, sir, but I don't have a bike with me. Without a bike, you will not get this job. You better go now. The boy left the place thinking about what to do next. He had little money with him that he could feed himself to just a few days. But he doesn't want to get back to the village without a job. He needed to be confident about getting a job. He needed some hope. While he was thinking, he came across a big vegetable market and an idea sparkled. He decided to buy vegetables from the market with the money that he had. And then he would go door to door selling his vegetables by walking. By the end of the evening, he'd sold all his vegetables and had a really good profit. And he gained confidence and hope that he could earn from this. From then on, every morning he went to the market and, buy, and bought fresh vegetables and went door to door selling them until they were all gone. He continued this hard work every day and within years he developed a business and he soon became one of the biggest food chain retailers in the region. Some years went by and one of his new friends visited his big house where there were lots of cars in his garage. Seeing this, his friend asked, you have a good collection of cars. Do you have any bike collections? And the man replied, I never bought a bike for myself. In surprise, he asked, why didn't you buy a bike? The man replied, if I had a bike with me, I wouldn't have all these cars. Hope means that we can have confidence to face anything in our lives. We're bringing this study now to a conclusion. And I'm just going to read you some of the words of Isaiah 65 that speaks of new heavens and a new earth. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and crying will never be heard. And a prayer. Lord God, we thank you for the visions of a new creation. We thank you that people are seeking new ways of living. We thank you that you prompt us to address these situations and there are inventions and things made that will help us. But we ask that you would direct us, point us to these things, make it known to us how important it is that we are part of the new creation. Guide us in our role as being ambassadors of your kingdom on earth today. And we pray that people would experience a yearning to be part of such a world. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Tears will be wiped from eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Amen. We hope that you have enjoyed joining with us and maybe you've learned a little bit more about what Isaiah was saying 
but do read the whole book of Isaiah for yourselves. Now that's a challenge. See you again. Bye.